Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just a... Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Professor Madhura, Madhara, congratulations. And I know that all will go well this afternoon. You're in good hands. So I'm looking forward to listening to your lecture this afternoon. Thank you. So it's the registrar speaking. I need to put, yeah, my, you. put in my video quickly here. Thank you. <laughs> How are you doing? Well, and you? Thank you. I'm doing fine. Good. Afternoon, Professor Madal. Hi, Cathy. Hi, Hi, Cathy. Hello. Okay, we, we're going to go live. I just need everybody to be muted. Thanks. Prof. Madal, you may now do the official welcome. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Principal, Prof. Nana Poku, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Prof. Maxwell Mudara. The Vice Chancellor conveys his congratulations and best wishes to Prof. Maxwell Mudara. Inaugural lectures form part of the university public lecture series and may only be presented by newly appointed full professors who have been appointed in academic schools and centers. Inaugural lectures presents an opportunity for showcasing the exciting and groundbreaking research and teaching being carried out by professors in our university. Each lecture represents a significant milestone in an academic career, providing official recognitions of their promotions or appointment to full professorship. These lectures are furthermore an ideal opportunity for new professors to introduce themselves, to present an overview of their own contributions to their fields, to career, academic careers, peers, student research and collaborators. Inaugural lectures are also a platform for celebrating a professor's academic achievements with his uh, family, friends, mentors, and colleagues. I would like to acknowledge the following guests, members of council, members of executive management, members of Senate, our inaugurant this afternoon, Professor Maxwell Madara, family and friends of Professor Maxwell Madara, academics, professional staff, alumni and distinguished guests. A special welcome to our guests 
from universities and organizations within South Africa, African continent, and across the globe. Distinguished guests, it is my pleasure to now introduce our acting dean, head of School of Agricultural, Earth and Environmental Sciences, Professor Julius Beer, who will now formally introduce the inaugurant, Professor Maxwell Mudara. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Dean VC. A very good afternoon to all our guests um, joining us from across the globe. I would like to introduce the inaugurant uh, this afternoon, Professor Maxwell Mudara. Uh, professor Maxwell Mudara is a full professor in the discipline of agricultural economics uh, in the College of Agriculture, Engineering and uh, Science at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Professor Mudara received a Bachelor of Science Agriculture Honors degree from the University of Zimbabwe in 1985 and in Master of Philosophy in Agricultural Economics from the same university in 1993. He obtained a PhD degree in Food and Resource Economics from the University of Florida uh, in the USA in 2002. Professor Mudara joined the University of KwaZulu-Natal in 2005 and became the director of the Farmers Support Group in 2006. He became a full academic in 2011 within the discipline of agricultural economics as a lecturer. He ascended to the position of associate professor in 2019 and became a full professor of agricultural economics in 2023. Professor Mdara's research is on the economics of smallholder farming systems. Uh, in particular, his research focuses on understanding the drivers of smallholder farmers' technology adoption, including analysis of food security outcomes, climate change adaptation, and impact assessment. Research on the trade-offs between water, energy, and food in smallholder production system is his most recent research area of interest. His research emerges with policy recommendations that can be applied to improve the lives of rural people. The research uses quantitative methods, including econometrics models to understand and explore how to enhance the farming system. He has successfully completed the supervision of eight PhD and 31 master students, mentored two postdoctoral fellows and published over 80 research articles in Scopus and ISI index journals. Professor Mudara um, is currently supervising six PhD students, and he has also examined a number of MSc and PhD theses from various uh, universities in South Africa. He is a reviewer of several high impact factor journals, such as uh, food security, uh, amongst others. Professor Mudara co-authored a book entitled Community Innovations in Sustainable Land Management, Lessons from the Field in Africa. Professor Mudara is a National Research Foundation, uh, NRIF, South Africa, C2 rated scientist since 2022. He is a member of the African Association of Agricultural Economists, member of Agricultural Economics Association of South Africa, between 2010 and 2012, he served as the secretary of the Southern and Eastern African Association for Farming Systems Research and Extension after serving as a council member between 2005 and 2010. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite the inaugurant to deliver the lecture. Over to you, Prof Mudara. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof. Sibia, for those uh, kind words, and also to Prof. Uh, Madao. Uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, this afternoon uh, to present this inaugural lecture as a, 
a professor of agricultural economics at the University of KwaZulu Natal. Uh, I'm going to present uh, the inaugural lecture on a title uh, saying uh, the DNA of smallholder farmers and its implications for technology adoption, livelihoods, and environmental services. Uh, let me just give you a short outline of how we're going to travel here. Uh, I'm going to try to identify the significance of smallholder farmers uh, in the world, uh, and then uh, look at the characteristics of smallholder farmers and also their definitions. Uh, I'll introduce uh, or talk about the sustainable livelihoods framework, uh, and then look at the factors determining uh, smallholder farmer characteristics the underlying factors uh, determining their characteristics. Uh, we'll look at uh, some generic models and their implications. Uh, I'll also look at the vicious and virtuous uh, cycles uh, and the direction that uh, we drive it uh, in, in recommending things for small farmers. Uh, then I'll make uh, conclusions and recommendations. Sorry. In terms of uh, small the farmer significance, there are about uh, 1.4 people in Africa uh, in 2023. Uh, and the World Bank in 2020 estimated that uh, 65 or 66% of Africa's population is rural. Uh, uh, and uh, 33 million of these uh, rural uh, people are actually uh, smallholder farmers or lead families uh, that are in, in farming. Uh, on average, on average, smallholder farmers or farms in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa are 1.6 hectares. Uh, they dominate the landscape in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and they con contribute immensely uh, to the food uh, production uh, in, the, in the region. If we come closer to home uh, in South Africa, we also find that uh, uh, the farm distribution shows that uh, smallholder farmers generally, or uh, largely have less than a hectare of land. Uh, if you look at this uh, table, it shows that uh, like 83% uh, of the smallholder farmers have got uh, less than a hectare of land. And then if we go to 94%, uh, that's uh, below five uh, hectares. So they generally have uh, a small hectare, uh, areas, but there are uh, 2.5 million smallholder farmers uh, in South Africa compared to uh, 35,000 uh, large uh, scale farmers. There are various definitions that have been proposed for uh, smallholder farmers, uh, and they kind of differ between uh, what we have in South Africa versus in, in the international uh, space. Uh, in South Africa, the definitions largely focus on a land size, on a participation in markets. Uh, in 2010, Ben Cousin uh, rightly objected to the classification of smallholder farmers as a homogeneous group. Uh, and Cousins used the farmers' levels of surplus, surpluses realized for sale as a distincting, distinguishing factor. Or, or dimension. The government uh, in, in South Africa emerged with a classification of smallholder farmers, which differentiated the subsistence farmers from uh, the mainstream smallholder farmers. And this was uh, based on the, um, the amount of produce uh, that uh, uh, they put on the market. The, the government's uh, definitions were largely to show that the farmers uh, are not uh, homogeneous, but also allowed it to uh, target uh, between uh, subsistence versus 
uh, smallholder farmers. But internationally, we find that smallholder farmers are, uh, are considered as family farms is one of the de defining factors. Uh, they are resource constrained in terms of land. Uh, we've seen that, uh, and they've got limited access to markets, uh, input and output markets, and they've got limited uh, access to research and extension support. Uh, in, when we look at uh, the significance of smallholder farmers in the economies, uh, we find that uh, if we start with the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, they put poverty eradication as the primary goal of the 17 goals that are listed by United Nations. Uh, and given that uh, poverty is actually very situated in the small farming system or rural landscape, uh, then it means that uh, this is a primary objective of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, in South Africa, the National Development Plan identified underutilized land in the communal areas is an opportunity for achieving agricultural development and creation of uh, a million new jobs by 2030. Uh, so there is a general view uh, that the smallholder farmers will be a vehicle through which poverty eradication and uh, rural development can be achieved. Uh, and indeed, uh, it is possible that uh, there is hope that smallholder farmers can actually be the drivers of national economies uh, uh, in Africa. The national agricultural strategy also acknowledges uh, the, the need to alleviate uh, poverty and achieve uh, food security uh, through smallholder farmers. Uh, so we see that smallholder farmers are important for economic development, but they, in because of their interaction with the nature and uh, natural resources, they are very much intertwined with uh, environmental degradation and climate change as well. When you look at uh, some of the challenges that uh, smallholder farmers uh, face, uh, we see extreme temperature variation, climate related, uh, erratic, uh, erratic rainfall uh, distribution, which they have to deal with with their media resources. And then there's poor uh, rural infrastructure, such as roads, limit, uh, limited mobile connectivity, uh, limited budgets, extension service, and, and, and lack of market access. Here, I just present some generic characteristics of uh, smaller farmers, again, less low, low uh, areas, uh, use of household labor, uh, mega capital available, limited mechanization, uh, limited sub surpluses, uh, and rain fed with little irrigated agriculture. In South Africa, uh, we see that uh, access to markets is only limited to 20% of the smallholder farmers and credit is also quite constrained. Across the border, we see in Zimbabwe, uh, farmers were planting 0.7 hectares to maize. And in total, on average, they're planting 1.2 hectares. And they were planting diverse crops, up to nine crops uh, being planted by the smallholder farmers, including many other minor crops. Uh, and when we look at also the, the, the characteristic, we find that there is a differentiation between male and female, with males trying to uh, push for cash crops and females going for more food crops. Furthermore, in terms of characteristics, is the law of fertilizer application in smallholder farming uh, uh, systems. It's between eight, uh, to 15 kgs per hectare in sub-Saharan Africa, compared to uh, 150 to uh, uh, 100 to 150 in Latin America and Asia. So Africa is, uh, is lacking very much behind and our smaller farmers are, are lacking uh, in terms of uh, production and productivity. 
They use the organic uh, materials like your keto manure and the like, yes. Uh, they also use indigenous uh, veg, uh, seed materials, which might have low yield potential. Uh, yield in, in general, because of the kind of agricultural practices is limited to an average of about 500 kilograms per hectare of maize against a potential of more than five uh, tons per hectare. Some, some have achieved, uh, from, some farms have achieved more than 10 hectares, 10 K, uh, uh, tons per hectare. So there is potential, vast potential for improvement through smallholder farmers, if we can get them on, on board. Uh, the low mechanization is a cause for low efficiency uh, and the low uh, farmer to uh, extension worker to farmer ratio is also contributing to, to the poor performance of this sector. Uh, as a result, uh, poverty remains endemic in the smaller farming sector and food, and food insecurity and malnutrition are prevalent. Accompanying all these challenges is that environmental degradation is happening all over in small farms uh, and also productivity potential is falling. So I propose here that there is need to recognize, uh, and this is how we are going to work on this uh, in this lecture, that there is a need to recognize diversity across smallholder farmers and use this knowledge in designing targeted interventions uh, because of the numbers that we are talking about we need to recognize the, the, the diversity among them and then take advantage of the opportunities they present uh, and interventions can result in improved efficiency uh, productivity and uh, hopefully put us on a, a growth trajectory the argument that we need to put an emphasis on smallholder farmers is premised on the need to, to use them as a driver for the fourth industrial revolution in Africa or in sub-Saharan Africa. Indeed, it's, a, it's an abundant resource in Africa, at least the smallholder farms and their land. Historically, we have seen uh, countries like US and uh, Japan taking advantage of their relative resource endowments and using that is uh, propelling them to, towards uh, economic development. US, for example, used the abundance of land in America uh, during the early days. And Japan also recognized its land scarcity and used its, uh, uh, the, the human resources to, to, to improve uh, productivity or to work on their productivity uh, and, and excel in economically. So we need to advance, you take advantage of the numeral uh, size or numeric size of the smaller farms and use them as a stepping stone uh, or a stepping, uh, yes, for, for advancing uh, development in Africa. Now, we have uh, the, the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework as a, a guiding uh, to understand how uh, the smaller farms work. Uh, to start with, there is a background in everything that, uh, or where the farmers find themselves. There is a context uh, in which they work with. There is some policies, some con some macroeconomic conditions uh, and some politics that uh, uh, they have to work with or recognize. Uh, so uh, despite whatever they want to do, there is a space in which they are finding themselves in. And we also know that there are resources that are at their disposal. In this framework, uh, it, it generally it has been divided between human, natural, uh, social, physical, and financial resources. I'll explain this a little bit further. Uh, and then there, there are rules and regulations and uh, uh, facilitating uh, policies that are in place, uh, and even at times frustrating policies uh, and, and, and institutions 
that allow or inhibit smallholder farmers. And so this is the this third block. When we put all these things together, where we are talking about the human and the social and the and natural, those lead to farmers making decisions on where they want to go. And the argument is that this will lead to different outcomes. The outcomes could be more income, could be increased well-being, uh, for example, uh, could be better food security uh, scenarios. Uh, but the important part is that when we say DNA, is that the farmers have got specific characteristics. They find themselves having an identifiable or unique context and also unique assets at human uh, and, 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 and then they've got uh, the, the different institutions, rules and regulations that they have to operate within. So this illustrates a complexity uh, and a sources of heterogeneity amongst the smallholder farmers, which have got an implication on the technology adoption that we might want them to, to, to take. So if I can just run through quickly an understanding of the context, the context will have things like the policies, the history, uh, whether there was a history of violence or peace, uh, the climate, uh, the agroecological conditions, which we take as given. And then in terms of the human uh, capital, we, have, we find the, their uh, skills uh, that uh, uh, people in a household that work in a small water farm have got. And then there's even the health conditions of the people in a family uh, and the, the quality of the labor that is available. Uh, they are in specific numbers of uh, people in the household and whether they've been trained uh, and so on. From a social point of view, socially, we derive a lot of uh, support from our next of kin and the like. And so similarly, smallholder farmers also have got social networks uh, and these determine whether they can take a risk or not, to, not take a risk whether they can count on their neighbors or not. Uh, these things relate to, for example, being members of groups uh, and associations and so on. But they find themselves in particular spaces, uh, particular natural resources, which they can draw on uh, for, for sustenance. Uh, and that determines what decisions they can make uh, in, in, when faced with uh, technology choices. In terms of financial stocks uh, uh, resources, there could be uh, stocks, there could be an amount of money that uh, also they got, or they can have some inflows of money that can be coming in uh, gradually. Uh, then from the physical uh, capital, we're talking here about infrastructure, uh, the amount of uh, shelter, buildings, quality of buildings that they have, uh, the amount of transport that is available, and this affects, for example, access to uh, markets and, and also things like energy, water, and communications. So having illustrated that, it is important to say that the farming is occurring with a certain level of constraints, uh, such as uh, your poor soils, your limited markets, limited extension service, your climatic conditions, and a specific land sizes, which we've seen is limited. So this can either lead to maybe low, uh, with these constraints, you can have low uh, crop yields, low livestock output, and have got a further cascaded effect of uh, food insecurity or poverty from those, uh, if you've got those constraints at the top. Now at the center, is the of this household that comprises the smallholder farm, 
uh, is is then uh, I just want to, is then the 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 household head the household head has got some immediate characteristics and some peripheral characteristics the immediate characteristics that relate to the head of household uh, could be your land size family size and, and so on the, in the green uh, green circle your age in particular your education uh, level of education and then outside the feather which affects the household uh, is the, your, your, your traditional authorities, your, your policies, your agroecological region and infrastructure. Right, so I've identified this uh, internal and uh, external factors where the internal are the ones that lead to age and, and so on. And then the external are the ones that are a bit uh, outside the farm, uh, your distance to the market and not under the control of the farm. So we see that they, they are different factors that have got an effect on smallholder farms. Uh, and we're looking, we are going to look at some of these vectors uh, quickly, uh, such as age. Uh, age, we know that people grow from a head of households that are maybe in their 20s uh, until their 60s and 70s, and these days maybe to 90s uh, and 100s. Uh, but in that growth uh, time or over those years, the age has got a specific effect on how the household behaves or how the household performs. For example, the effect of age, if we look at a, a plus being an increase or a positive effect and a, a, a negative being a decrease or a, a negative effect, we can find that the, as the age increases, the investment drive of the household kind of tails off with age, we naturally think that. And then with resource accumulation also, there is initially, there is more or less when the family is or head of household is young. And then when they grow old, then there's more uh, accumulation of resources. We expect that it, in terms of remittance, when the, the head of household is growing older, there are more possibilities of getting remittances because then the children can start working and the like. Uh, I can also use another example of indigenous knowledge that as the person grows, the head of household grows or in, in terms of years, then there's an accumulation of indigenous knowledge that we should not find in younger head of households and so on. Okay, uh, excuse me, my slides were not moving. The second one is gender. Gender, uh, basically in most uh, African countries, we know that it's uh, patriarchal uh, and uh, males uh, dominate. Uh, so we give normally just one to illustrate for males and zero for females. Uh, and we find that the positive, it means that males have got an advantage, uh, whereas a negative means that females have got an advantage. In this case, we find that access to land, access to resources such as water in irrigation schemes or even in dry land, uh, where they're using some uh, uh, crude resources or crude sources of water, uh, access to services, and even the resultant productivity. They are all to the advantage of males. 
uh, and food security outcomes are more favored towards males than female headed households. One of the things that we also distinguish in research is, uh, uh, that we do is de facto a distinguishing between de facto and de jure uh, head of household, female head of households, where de facto uh, female head of households are when uh, the head of household is not, with a male, is not physically present in the household all the time. Uh, the jury is where the, the female is on her own all the time, or is single. And we look at a, a, a education. There's also uh, effects on access to information. Uh, people learn to interpret information uh, when they're educated. They become innovative when they can read and write uh, and, and, and take notes uh, when things are being discussed and so on. Uh, they, there's better market access uh, because they can use information better. Uh, and the nutritional outcomes we expect because they have a better knowledge of how to package their food and so on are better uh, when the, there is education. So the more education a household has had, has, uh, then there they is more likely to be positive outcomes on all of those dimensions. We also talk about family size. Family size affects available labor, but also at the, at the same time, it affects the number of people that have to be fed. So it can increase the land uh, farmed, but it generally leads to uh, the, when the size of the family is large, the productivity uh, can be low because then you've got many people working on a limited space of land and the food security outcomes tend to be negative. Uh, similarly, when you look at uh, farm, farm size, uh, production can increase because you've got a bigger land, but uh, there is also potential to realize uh, greater surpluses just on farm size on its own without merging it with the family size. Now, when we look at some few examples of just two examples of external factors, infrastructure, uh, we see that infrastructure can, can uh, enhance income of households, productivity, because they access uh, resources, inputs, and so on. Uh, and similarly, access to markets uh, increases uh, income, uh, increases access to inputs, uh, which can lead to productivity and food security outcomes are positively uh, impacted. So market access is very limited. We've already pointed out that in, in South Africa in particular, uh, there is a liberalization required that farmers were to organize on their own. And the NDP or National Development Plan uh, identifies the need to improve farmers' access. Uh, and so it recognizes some of the, the challenges that smaller farmers are facing. Livestock is another one uh, where a positive uh, livestock numbers uh, can actually lead to uh, income, uh, can also lead to greater area planted, uh, more agricultural productivity, uh, production, and also uh, food security outcomes, positive food security outcomes. There's more food produced uh, in timeliness of planting or farming activities, increase uh, the, the amount of food that is available. So, having said all those things that are putting uh, coming together, we see that smallholder farmers actually have got a utility maximizing decision process that they go through, given the resources that we've identified, given the capabilities that they have, they then look for a, a utility, the, the one choice of combination of activities that can result in their greatest satisfaction from whatever they are doing. And the development challenge that we face is to understand the forces that drive these farmers at arriving at that utility maximizing 
activity or set of activities. And then if we can identify these utility maximizing uh, conditions uh, or, or, or decisions, then we can then also uh, come up with interventions to satisfy farmers' needs. And hopefully they'll end up adopting uh, and working in sync with whatever we are proposing. We use generally uh, agricultural uh, or econometric models. Uh, and in these econometric models, we are basically recognizing the multiple factors that uh, come to play in influencing a farmer's uh, outcome of uh, food security or production or, 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 or whatever. So the why is the outcome that we are looking at. Is it food security? Is it uh, productivity? Is it uh, market participation or whatever? As an outcome. And then we identify the factors that are most likely to identify that kind of behavior. And these are what we call the X uh, uh, variables uh, or the independent variables, uh, which I'm calling here the DNA. The DNA. Sorry, Prof, can I just chip in quickly? Your, unfortunately, your slides aren't moving. Do you just want to check whether on your system that you have clicked through, or you may need to just re-share um, your presentation? Thank you. Apologies moving. for my chipping in. They're not moving. So you want me to stop share? And then share again. And then share again, please. And then just get back to the slide that you're dealing with now. Thank you. Is that fine? We Is have the okay? slide generic eco econometric model. Is that where you are now? Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Prof. Yes. So. Yes, I was saying that uh, the the X is is a, a, a basket of for the independent variables that are found within the household and which influence the decisions uh, of whether of or the outcomes of a specific outcome, whether it's food security uh, or it's a production levels or or, or whatever. So. This is what I'm calling the DNA. What are these variables that we are putting in, uh, and which we've identified in, in previous slides? And I hope that uh, they were showing. Uh, and th th this, this, each of these variables, when we do our econometric models, they run or they have an associated uh, beta uh, uh, parameter, which indicates the extent to which the variable uh, influences the outcome of why. Uh, so I'm not going to be too complicated on that, but the, the these models allow us to see the, the effect that the specific, each specific, specific variable is having and to recognize that it's not only one variable that has got an effect on uh, the, the out, outcome that we are desiring. And with these models, we can then uh, look at, of course, what are the policy implications. We can also do a simulation and see what if we we we, we were to to implement a, a program to maybe make uh, some resources available and uh, some uh, support available. What could be the effect on the uh, desired outcome that we have in mind? We have and and. This is where I might write. We also have an experience of variables that tend to positively affect households in the short term, or at least in within a certain range. And then beyond a certain range, they tend to reduce uh, the outcomes. For example, we have got variables such as age, Maybe in younger age levels, you can have positive growth uh, in food security, but at old age, 
uh, it can lead to uh, uh, negative effects on food security. Uh, we have got things like farm size, household size, uh, uh, credit, which tend to have this uh, uh, kind of uh, quadratic uh, outcome. Uh, and the kind of uh, implication is the understanding that there are variables that have got an optimal level at which performance uh, is maximized, beyond which uh, it may be detrimental to the household. So that understanding of the behavior of certain variables within households is very critical in, in, in moving forward with policy making. We then say that we need to have a move from the vicious cycle that we are currently moving in, where we've got a, a negative feedback effects uh, between uh, poverty, which leads to poor soil management, poor animals, uh, low yields, and, and leading to environmental degradation. And then further leading to low income and uh, poor uh, outcomes of food security. The desire is to push or to come up with the right for recommendations that can take us to the virtuous cycle, cycle, where then we tend to then have positive feeding effects between improved livelihoods and environmental preservation. Because without this uh, virtuous circle, we are going to go back to the vicious circle and there's going to be environmental degradation and uh, we are going to co contribute more to uh, climate uh, change and even be more vulnerable to climate change. When we are individuals, we are more resilient, we are less vulnerable uh, or, or the farmers are less vulnerable and that is the desirable uh, side. Then let me conclude that we know that small farmers have got small farms that uh, they are using generally low levels of fertilizers and so on, which are unsustainable. They've got poor access to, to markets, poor participation or limited participation because of their uh, low surpluses, uh, uh, high distances to the, to the uh, markets or just deficit areas. Uh, low uh, technology adoption because of the technologies that are not suitable uh, for, for their circumstances. And that leads to the vicious uh, uh, cycle that we've identified. And the implications is that we need more refined typo typologies of smallholder farmers so that we can then develop or identify the rightful policies that can stimulate adoption and the different practices that are desirable. Uh, because smaller farmers are independent, they make their own choices as they want to maximize their utilities. And it, 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 interventions should be targeted uh, at, for example, inputs, a credit, uh, and also uh, extension. The recommendations, we need to maybe take a stepwise uh, approach or, and also an approach that brings small farmers into practice or play with us because they are so complex. Unlike the large scale commercial farms, we need to have an action research approach, also a stepwise approach in terms of our recommendations of technologies rather than just a blanket uh, or massive uh, recommendations. Uh, and also smaller farmers could benefit or will benefit from investments in things like uh, that are external to their own uh, and also those which are internal, uh, such as your research and extension, your rural roads, irrigation schemes, your education of the farmers and their uh, family members, uh, also energy provision. And I can propose here some maybe that can be controversial or maybe acceptable to others, but we can maybe propose that the government should propose should facilitate market access and improved access to resources uh, because these are quite significant 
uh, constraints facing smaller farmers. But the question is, can government please uh, provide uh, targeted uh, subsidized inputs, targeted uh, subsidized inputs, maybe yes. Uh, they can also government subsidize market access. I think they should, and maybe take uh, uh, resources from other areas that could be uh, maybe a bit wasteful. Uh, the governments could also, by so doing, lead us to the virtuous cycles in economic growth that we so much desire. I would like to take this opportunity to thank, uh, firstly, uh, the late Professor Hildebrand, Peter Hildebrand of the University of KwaZulu Natal, of the University of, of Florida in the USA. Uh, he he uh, really introduced me to understanding these issues of uh, the complexities of smallholder farmers uh, and how we need to be sensitive to their different dimensions. I also want to thank uh, fellow colleagues uh, and researchers, uh, too numerous to mention, uh, but we have interacted in various spaces and I've learned a lot from uh, interacting with my colleagues uh, and I continue to learn. Uh, I've got uh, past students and current students uh, that I've, I'm supervising and they've supervised. Uh, students might take you as uh, being uh, very hard on them uh, as a professor or a supervisor, but uh, I'll be doing that so that I can learn. And I, indeed, I've learned a lot from the uh, students that I've interacted with. Uh, uh, lastly, I want to, to, to thank uh, the smallholder farmers uh, that I've interacted with in different spaces across different countries uh, in Africa. Last, I want to thank my family, uh, my immediate family, my wife, my uh, sons and the daughter. Uh, I also want to thank my extended family uh, for the support they've given me. Uh, I've been blessed uh, and been given a long leash to pursue my interests and in that I've done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Ndara. Um, we hardly get professors of that caliber uh, in that space. On behalf of the University Senate, we would like to congratulate you and we wish you more success in your academic endeavor. And we would love you to breed more Professor Ndara's like you in that particular field. And I want to thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you.